It's one of the most terrifying and enduring tales in all of true crime. A couple out on a lover's lane, just innocent teens in love spending time together. The passion of knowing they may get caught at any time, when suddenly it seems that their good time might be busted by the cops. But whoever pulls up doesn't announce themselves. Rather, they begin to shoot at you and your sweetheart without provocation. In 1968, this was a reality for the residents of some quiet little towns in Northern California. The reality of the Zodiac Killer. All right, everybody, I have called this press conference here today to verify that I, Raphael Edwards Cruz, am 100% not the Zodiac Killer. I just wanted to get that out in the air. I would never get excited about uh, approaching a teen couple uh, out in their cars at night, unsuspecting, and just... Anyways, uh, I have time for one question before I get out of here. Ted, 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 Ted. Yes, Ted, you, right I've seen here. you here before. Yes. What's your question? Frosty Daniels here from Metro News One. Quick question for you. What do you have to say about the allegations of your head keep on getting bigger and bigger, but your face shrinking? Have you had the surgery to make yourself look more like Donald Trump? You know, I've had this question before. And Reddit has some theories, but let me tell you, I am not susceptible to the me, you know, the me's from the Wii, the, the classic gaming system. I am not susceptible to the face shrinking of the me syndrome. Don't you worry that it may be offensive to the me population. I got to catch a flight to Cancun. I'll talk to y'all later. But Ted, 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 Ted. <laughs> I don't know what Ted Cruz sounds like, but I hope that was close. <laughs> it's also very funny. Sometimes Jacob just walks in and says, so I have an idea, and you, yeah. never, you never know where it's going to go, and oh, yeah. this one's very funny. I never, I never really give you any preliminary info either. I just kind of throw it at you, and then I say, hey, we're going. So Honestly, that's here we the, are. That has to be the beautiful thing about being the one that presses record. Yeah, it is. It's fun. because no, also be time, never know. Yeah, there'll also be times, a little behind the gems for everyone, there'll be times where I'm like, are we recording? Like, I've just been, <laughs> I've been talking for like Rambling. 10 minutes. Yes, it's how it goes, you know? And then sometimes we just talk about Republican senators for a little bit. Raphael. Speaking of Republican senators, welcome to the Gems of History podcast, everybody. I'm Jacob Shop, your host, and with me is... Soon to be Republican Senator of Wisconsin, Evan Roosh. Oh yes, uh, I, I'm announcing my campaign today. <laughs> I'll just throw it on the uh, the dockets of things to run for. You, you're approaching the age for candidacy, so better start I, <laughs> saving now. Well, I should probably also get some sort of plan together. You know, how are we going to combat? You know. Baseball teams being like, we don't want to serve beer till the eighth inning, like stuff like that. The important, important Dude, issues. Brewers are serving beer till the, after the seventh now. I did, yeah. I so saw that. Wisconsin's getting even more drunk. Let's go. I know a lot of players were like, but everyone's going to be hammered, and the state of Wisconsin's like, shut up, you narc. <laughs> <laughs> As if they're not already hammered by the time they enter the park. Right. It's kind of interesting with baseball. Games have been shortened by a full half hour. Yeah, they're actually. It's nice. interesting to watch. Yeah, I like like I'll it. take this. I mean, everyone that brings up the the pitch clock, I'm just like, every other sport has a clock. Like, yeah. there's a shot clock. There's a play clock in football. Mm -hmm. Like, ev pretty much every other sport, except you guys, were doing something. So even golf is starting to mandate like a shot clock type thing. Yeah, like golf. That I sport mean, hasn't yeah. changed <laughs> in a hundred years since the Irish were like, let's. Put a ball in a gopher hole. Can we get that for like amateur golf too? So if I'm out on the course and I get paired with a random who takes nine different practice swings and takes like five minutes every time they hit the ball, I can just blow an air horn or something. We can just start instituting that when we go out with friends, except like ice them if they yeah, break the shot clock. That's the way like to that. do it. Yeah. Uh, anyways, Evan, how are you today? Doing great. Like we talked about last week, recently got engaged and... Now all the wedding planning is, is starting, and it is very exciting, a little stressful, but very exciting. At least you're like way ahead of it, so 
Yeah, it's we not are. like you're saving it till the last minute. <laughs> That's what I thought too. I'm like, aren't we a little ahead of it? Then my fiance is like, what did you just say? <laughs> <laughs> Nothing. Like, Nothing, honey. Yeah. But no, it's been good, honestly. I'm trying not to talk about something other than the weather right now. True, true. It's just that it's actually nice here for months. So. <laughs> <laughs> weather talk. But you've been stuck inside doing house renovations, so. Yeah, painted the whole house. We're literally recording in a... Yeah, your basement is about as cluttered as my head is right now from yeah. doing this research, so... <laughs> it honestly looks like a hoarder's apartment. <laughs> kind of, yeah. Like, that's a compliment. It's a, it's very fun. There's We're looking around, there's several wreaths just laying about. A toilet seat? A to- two toilet seats. Two, <laughs> yeah, toilet, two toilet seats. seats. <laughs> not, they're not used. <laughs> they're, 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 if you had used toilet seats just laying around, can you, you imagine like trying to sell a used toilet seat on like Facebook Marketplace? <laughs> Gently used. <laughs> Gently used, yeah. Soft cheeks have laid upon this <laughs> yeah. ivory bowl. That's yeah. marketing for you right there. Hey, man. Whatever you, people can get for a deal, they'll take. Can't imagine what people... Oh, Zodiac Killer. I love that topic. And, and <laughs> Talking about toilet seats. Toilet seats, yeah. Well, he was a toilet seat of a man. Yeah, man. I have been living the true conspiracy theorist's life this entire week so far. I'm just like, haven't slept that much. I'm eating like a divorcee. Like, <laughs> it's just all coming together. My car's been breaking. Like, everything is happening in You're my life. You're just <laughs> ripping Milwaukee's best <laughs> yeah. light and TV dinners. Just looking. You cr- love, st- like, you just have a hankering for Stouffer's lasagna. <laughs> I'm just like absolutely crazed sitting in my living room, my underwear. Like, yeah, it's been, it's been a research week. That's for sure. You're the furniture in the apartment is literally just a lawn chair and a TV <laughs> that's on the ground. The hey, parallels. That's with- all men need. Right, right. And we get ripped on for it. Yep. And it's like, no, I literally just need a place to park my tuckus. Yep. I can and furnish the wash. wash furnish TV. my entire house for $300. <laughs> just like, Honestly, yeah. Yeah. But yeah, as Evan mentioned, we're talking about the Zodiac Killer today. Uh, one of probably, if not the most discussed true crime case in the world, besides like Jack the Ripper, maybe. I, I mean, that's a great comparison. It, it pretty much is America's Jack the Ripper. Yeah. I mean, both of them had five victims that are mm-hmm. like s- dedicated to them that are, we know these are him. And there's like so many others that people are like, I think he did this one and that one and this one. And they both sent letters to the press to get their name out there. Yeah. It's strikingly similar. It's just the way that they killed their victims. Was Early different. conspiracy theory. It's actually just a family business. So like Jack the Ripper. <laughs> Or the Zodiac Killer's great 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 grandfather, or whatever that ends up being, was actually just Jack the Ripper. Hey man, if that's the <laughs> that's the family title, like yeah. on the wall, it says "Home to the- Home of the Rippers." <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Not gonna lie, that's a pretty strong either like football team. We're talking a heavy metal band. That is a good f- the Matt. Rippers. That's a good mat to have in front of your front door. Oh, home, yeah. home of the Rippers. Like, you do not mess around. That kid does not get bullied in high school. That's yeah. dang sure. <laughs> but that sound that. Reminds me of how Mengele, like the Joseph Mengele, his family made farm equipment. So now you can yeah. buy like Mengele tractors. It's like, ugh. Well, I mean, it's almost not. Obviously, Mengele is far worse. But uh, the Kellogg brand also, where we co- <laughs> where we covered it, it's like, oh, he put Eat bland things. food to stop masturbating. Yeah, and also, or shove things up your pee hole. Yeah, that too. He did a lot of weird stuff. But also made some cornflakes. <laughs> that he did. Well, his, his brother. His brother did, yeah. yeah. But it, with the Zodiac Killer being as talked about as it is, there's literally podcasts dedicated to full, like multiple seasons of just dedicating to mm-hmm. the Zodiac Killer. So for us, we're just doing one episode. And yeah. that's obviously not enough time to cover everything in detail with this case. But we just kind of wanted to go over what the case was kind of cover his the crimes that we know for sure were the zodiac and then just throw around some conspiracies about who we think might have done it yeah and i'll be talking a little bit about the psychology behind it because of course with every serial killer there's immense human psychology behind their motivations uh so of course we're gonna be covering the killings and whatnot but i have some fun psychology tidbits uh, that i noticed it's an this is such an interesting one because normally for serial killers and stuff we like to cover their background and yeah. their childhood yeah we don't have any of that because yeah. we don't know who did it <laughs> so <laughs> it's it's pretty much just 
we're jumping straight into the murder. <laughs> this is also another parallel where like ancient stories from antiquity, yeah. also serial killers haven't been caught. <laughs> Unsolved <know nothing>. murderers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah, obviously we are going to be covering a serial killer. So there is going to be some content in this episode that might trigger certain people. So just, you're going into this episode after seeing the title, probably already knowing that, but I'm just throwing it out there as another caveat for But you. then they listen to the first five minutes and they're like, these guys are too goofy. Someone's going to get triggered <laughs> by just the toilet seats or my Ted Cruz impression. Well, you know, half the population might get triggered by the Ted Cruz impression. That is true. Yeah. yeah. So, and Bud Light. There you go. Now oh I think my, I got everybody. <laughs> oh my God. Don't get me started. All right. Let's jump into the story of the Zodiac Killer, shall we? So Benicia, California is currently a town of nearly 27,000 people. It's located on the San Francisco Bay, and it's known for, according to their website, its small town charm and its history. And it served as the state capital of California for over a year in the 1850s. I do love a good small town website like that. It reminds me of Pawnee, Indiana, like from Parks and Rec. <laughs> <laughs> but like it's like, like that. a small town charm. But we come from cities that have like 4,000 people, and they have 28,000 people. Yeah, we so come from unincorporated towns, <laughs> yeah. basically. <laughs> One of our favorite bars is in a town that's unincorporated, has right. like four houses. Right, right, so, right. <laughs> But in 1968, Benicia boasted only a population of around 7,000 and was very quiet and had nearly no crime. The residents that lived there were mostly middle class, and the biggest incidents for the cops to investigate were bar fights or maybe a domestic disturbance, but there hadn't been a murder in nearly half a decade by this point. But in that year, in 1968, the charm and the history of Benicia would change forever. The night of December 20th, 1968, was another night for the police department in Benicia. One officer with the unfortunately comical name of Russell T. Butterbach like there's no like we brought up middle school before that guy did get picked on yeah in middle school. <laughs> he's just this super kindly looking old man yeah. but I, then his name pops up on the bottom of the screen and you're like <laughs> this guy investigated the murder all right yeah we have our best man on it <laughs> yeah. butterbach <laughs> well that i don't remember which serial killer it was but they the officer group or like the squadron that took over the case to investigate called themselves the hot dog squad it's like guys come on well in the yorkshire ripper we covered they were the shit squad so oh, yeah. it's like, come on hey the boys in blue are not great at branding <laughs> that is good. true they have too much other stuff on their plate apparently hot dogs they don't but. need good branding they get free money anyway so right well there you go yeah so Russell T. Butterbach was on a call to try and find a fisherman whose truck was out on the road and the man hadn't returned from fishing around by around 8 o'clock. So someone called and said, hey, can you go check and see if my husband's out fishing? And Russell's usual partner was out sick, so he had a new guy joining him that night. They eventually rerouted to go to a local's Hell's Angels pad, which is a little different than trying to find a fisherman. Yeah, I did not expect to hear... like. Small town charm, all that good stuff. But they stopped at a Hell's, Hell's Angels Angel pad. There. <laughs> like, ever heard of them? Like, the most infamous motorcycle gang? Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, they, yeah, they rerouted to the Hell's Angels pad. And then once they were done there, they said they were there like a half hour or so. And th when they were leaving, they got another quick dispatch about a shooting. Meanwhile, another pair of officers, one of them named Pierre Bideau and his partner, had just recently made a drug bust for about a pound and a half of marijuana at a cabin that was owned by the city of Benicia. They drove down a backcountry road on their way back to the department to drop off the, the, sto the confiscated drugs, mm -hmm. and they said they didn't really see any other cars on their way. But then once they got back to the police station, as they were walking in, they heard their car dispatch go off about a shooting. As, as they were walking away, they turned around, got back in the car, and reported to the scene. And that was the same one that Russell Butterbach was going to. So a shooting in Benicia. Benicia. Thank you. I think. <laughs> it's either Benicia or Benicia. I don't know oh, which so. one it is. They said it like 94 times in the documentary I watched. Yeah, by the so way. So the Italians. <laughs> the documentary I watched was called This is the Zodiac Speaking. It's on YouTube. Like there's 
multiple different versions of it. It's really good, mm-hmm. but it's kind of old now. I don't know officially when it came out. So it's got like a lot of kind of dated information, but I mean, it's all still pretty much useful because nothing has really changed. We've just gotten a couple new pieces. Yeah. And my sources were crimereads.com as well as a podcast uh, known as the Murder Sheet. Uh, they had a pretty interesting guest on their coverage of this. So if you want more of an interview style, I guess. Do you know who the guest was? No, unnamed. Ooh. Yeah, unnamed. Did he have the voice changer and everything? <laughs> no, no, it wasn't that far. But they did a great job, and we I don't think we've ever highlighted another podcast on the show. But sweet. you know what? Got to give credit to where credit needs to be given. Sweet, sweet. As well as BBC.com. I used so many different websites to try and compile because this is the thing with doing any of the research on the crimes themselves and on the suspects there are so many different websites that say varying things on everything so i was trying to cross-reference everything that i was putting in as best i could so i used as many websites as possible but and with that same point with the different websites there's literally almost clicks in oh yeah this investigation for private citizens who are very adamant that this supposed suspect is a zodiac killer right yeah and then they get caught in like that classic echo chamber so even in it's just very funny like that's a tribe mentality that humans live by yeah it even it even involves true crime i mean there's a guy that's dedicated he started a website in 1998 called zodiackiller.com and he's been running it since and so he, he like compiles a bunch of information and granted he's doing like a ton of civilian research Mm -hmm. and there are so many people that (laughs) apparently come after him one of them specifically that he just constantly argues with and has an entire page on his website dedicated (laughs) to denouncing his personal attacks Mm -hmm. so when you get to that point (laughs) it's kind of like what are we doing here that's the definition of i have the time yeah (laughs) i have the time for this argument so on december 20th 1968 Two teens named David Faraday, age 17, and Betty Lou Jensen, age 16, were out on a known lover's lane in the area at around 10 p.m. after spending the night at their school planning a Christmas concert. It was their first date, and they were hanging out in David's Rambler, which is a a big station wagon, and they were parked off of Lake Herman Road, which was a small connecting road between Vallejo, California, and Benicia, and there was the same road that the police had just used as a shortcut to get back to their headquarters. But those cops, with Pierre Badeau, said they didn't see any cars there when they passed. It was normally a quiet road, with most of the traffic either being teens come to use that area for hookups, or people traveling home between two small towns for work. But shortly after the two teens arrived, another car pulled up. Without warning, a person from that car approached them and started to shoot at the teens in the Rambler. One of the bullets apparently shattered the large rear window. They think it was the first shot, which was possibly a warning shot. David and Betty Lou then attempted to scramble out of the passenger side of the car, but as they did, more shots rang out. David ended up getting shot behind the ear as he emerged from the car, and Betty Lou was shot five times in the back as she attempted to run away. Whoever shot them then left the scene quickly, leaving the two teens to be found shortly after by a passing local resident who alerted the police. So we need to rewind and just like go over a few things, right? Like this road that they're on, well, first off, again, very small town, right? Like 7,000 people. This road, by extension, it's basically used as a connection between two small towns or it's used for teen hookups, right? Yeah, it's a very like unincorporated road pretty much right so i think and i'm already getting into the conspiracy side of things like this person has pretty intimate knowledge of northern california of the area specifically knowing that he had a very good shot no pun intended of finding a couple there or finding people there right which i'll get into with my just like psychology conspiracies but it's just you this kind of rules out any in my opinion, any evidence to this one person not being a local. Yeah. You know, which I don't think that's disputed at all, but. 
yeah, most of the suspects we'll get into are kind of from the San Francisco area. But for this small, like everyone within Benicia and Vallejo knew that this road was kind of a hookup. Like all of those spots were pretty much known to like police and parents and kids, obviously. But yeah, if you're not from here, unless you're asking someone, hey, where did the teenagers hook up? (laughs) But yeah, I mean, they, the two teens also it's their first date, right? Yeah. So, like, this is just a known spot to go for for and, a date. And 16 and 17 years old, they're, yeah. like, sophomores. Getting shot at by a stranger. Yeah. And also right. very, very dark, too. Oh, yeah. So, like... There's no street lights on this road. Right. Yeah. So, they, other than knowing where it was, there's really no way to find it. Yeah. And they show... It's like the island of Pirates of the Caribbean. <laughs> That's how you weave in Pirates of the Caribbean to her. That's like old time gems. <laughs> and so we shall go, go to, to war. war. But they show in the, the documentary where this... It's literally just a, a turnoff of a road. It's not even like an actual road. It's ju- yeah. just like a little dirt turnoff that people can park at. So after the shooting, the Benicia Police Department were the first to the scene after being alerted by that local... And shortly after, Pierre Badeau responded as well after getting the call. And when the sheriff's office was eventually called to take over the the crime scene, Russell T. Butterbach arrived. They found Betty Lou lying face down, kind of on her side, down in the dirt, and she had bled out from the five gunshot wounds to her back. However, when they arrived, David Faraday was still breathing. He was apparently found holding a ring in his hand and They said that the way he was holding it made it appear as though someone was trying to take the ring from him, and he was kind of holding on to it from someone pulling it away. However, David was too far gone, and his body eventually gave up, and he died as well. Police marked off the scene and were able to recover multiple shell casings from outside the car, as well as retrieve bullet fragments out of Betty Lou's back. And the casings of these bullets were distinctly marked. It was Winchester Western Super X copper coated ammunition. It was a 22 caliber shot. There were no signs of robbery or sexual assault. It was pretty much just a senseless crime. Right. And you have to think the reason why the killer wanted that ring so bad is just that classic serial killer thing where you have little trophies from yep. your victims. And also, it's very important to remember the name of the casings, um, which we'll talk about in it, a little bit. Yeah, here. it comes up later. But that's very specific. Yes. So it, it, yes. having that evidence is kind of big because then it will help the investigation kind of do get some leads, which don't it's still unsolved. So it didn't really lead him anywhere. But right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> According to Pierre Badeau, the first reaction was to attempt to save David Faraday. But after he was attended to, the officers collected the bullet casings and marked where the bodies were. What the officers didn't do, though, was collect any soil samples or look for any signs of hair or foreign fibers that the assailant may have left behind. And in the documentary, Badeau laments that the procedures for homicide investigations weren't as particular and thorough as they are now, especially in a town where murders weren't a common occurrence. In a recounting of the timelines from the officers that night, they surmised that there was only a six-minute window in which there was nobody around that Lover's Lane turnoff And that was the time in which the killer had committed his murders. And obviously, the deaths of the teens shocked the community, but it was only the start of the terror for the Bay Area locals. Yeah, one of the key things or reoccurring things that I heard in my research was if this crime happens today, we most likely catch this man rather quickly, right? Yeah. Just what we have available. But, I mean, 1968, that just was a different time investigation yeah you know? and i mean it's even are, like with the black dahlia murders you know and just other famous murders at the time just just, just like oh or we talk about the uh one skit from john mulaney pretty much every <laughs> single time it's like boss there's a pile of blood over here gross gross clean okay. it up <laughs> <laughs> yeah. right so it's like they these small town cops didn't know to get dna or like look for that and i think that's another big thing is like how rural this spot this specific spot where this occurred was like if this was downtown san francisco as we'll see later on like they get fingerprints and stuff from it Mm -hmm. so i mean 
there's just those little things that these small town cops didn't know to do. And by that point, I'm sure there was already people crawling all over the crime scene. So it's, any evidence that was there is probably contaminated. So Right. And we even saw that with the, well, actually several axe murders that yeah, we've the, covered on the show. Yep. <laughs> Felisca. <laughs> yeah. So at Blue Rock Springs Park, which was a rural hangout spot for teenagers in the town of Vallejo that neighbored Benicia, it was normally another sort of a lover's lane, but it was more so like a park uh, where people can hang out. Lover's lane on the lake. Exactly. It was the night of July 4th, America Day. So the kids were out hanging there late into the night. The hot dog squad was off duty. <laughs> yeah. No, they were on duty on the grill. Oh, yeah. They... The amount of times they clipped the tongs just to see if they worked. Some local patrolmen, Ed Rust and John Lynch, were working late and got a dispatch call about possible shots fired at Blue Rock Springs Park, and other officers had been sent to check it out. The phone operator who took the original call said that around 12.10 a.m., she received a call from a young woman who said that kids were being shot at the park, and the operator said that the woman was extremely frantic. A second dispatch call went out about a shooting, and Ed Rust made the decision to go check it out as well. Another patrolman named Richard Hoffman was in the area, and he was the one that had responded first. So he got to the scene, and he found a young man lying on, the ba- on his back outside of a car, still alive, but making gurgling noises and reaching for help. Inside the car, a woman was in the driver's seat, and she had also been shot. Inside the car, the entire dash was covered in blood. The woman was still slightly breathing, but couldn't say anything when asked what happened. The ambulance arrived shortly after and loaded the young man inside first, and after lifting up the boy, the police found a bullet slug underneath his body, except this time it was a 9mm. The young woman in the car died shortly after the event. Again, it's a town or neighboring town, so local town to where all the killings happened. But the most surprising thing here is the brashness, like 1210. Like, that's the middle of the day. No, this is like midnight. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. sorry, sorry. <laughs> but he does get braver, like, as he goes on. Right. So right, right. It, it it is very interesting. But uh, it was uh, the story that Richard Hoffman, the officer that arrives on the scene first, because he rode in the ambulance with this girl after the shooting happened, and he was talking and to the the guy who was interviewing him for the documentary and the guy asked did you talk to her at all in the ambulance and mm-hmm. he's he's richard hoffman says there was no talking to her i could tell she was gone like the specific thing that he said was in the ambulance while they were giving her cpr they had her shirt off so they could give her cpr and as they were blowing air in he could see part of her bra Oh, like blowing up yeah. because the air was just coming out of her body right away. Yeah, from the so, cheapers. Yeah, so it's, it's rough. However, the young man who was shot would go on to survive, but he did suffer permanent damage from the attack. He was shot once through the side of the face and it traveled through his mouth and his tongue and out the bottom of his head, which left him with permanent speech problems. His name was Mike Maggio, and the woman was his girlfriend, Darlene Farron. She ended up getting shot nine times while Mike was hit five times. And according to Mike's testimony, he and Darlene had been seeing each other even though she was married. While they were at the Blue Rock Springs Park, a car approached them that appeared to be a compact brown car similar to a Chevy Corvair or Ford Mustang. Darlene apparently recognized the car, stating it was someone named Richard, according to Mike's recollection. The car left, but then came back with the headlights shining behind them. A man approached the car with a flashlight, and the young couple figured it was a cop, and as they got their IDs ready for the man, he began to shoot into the car. After this, Mike said he was able to get a look at the man before rolling out of the car, claiming the shooter was around 5'8 or 5'9, white, in his later 20s or early 30s, stocky, with a round face and brown hair. The infamous description. Yeah. And this is one of only two people who will survive an attack, and he's the only one that will see his face. Mm-hmm. So that's fourteen, like fourteen different shots. Like that is so many bullets. Like the nine and five. I think this is the fascinating, most fascinating thing about the Zodiac to me is that he never does the same thing. 
He uses no. a 22 in the first one. He uses a nine in this one. And as we'll see in the next attack, it's completely different. Yeah, completely mo- completely different motivation. Whereas most serial killers, like, for example, like the BTK. Yeah. Killer, like, they are very, 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 like, they stick to their same lane, if you will. Or Jack the Ripper, even. Like, he, right. he did the same thing. He just escalated as he went. This yeah, guy got more and more violent. Changes it every time. Yeah. So. Right. Well, and too, just like going up to the car, like you can see the confidence building. Yeah. So a little over a half hour after the attack, the same phone operator who took the original call about the shooting received another call. This time, it was from a man speaking in a very monotone voice. In her words, it sounded like he had rehearsed what he was going to say beforehand. The man said he wanted to report a double murder and gave the location of the shooting at Blue Rock Springs. When asked for his name and location, the man gave the details of the shooting, including what car the victims were in, as well as what gun was used. After that, he also claimed responsibility for the two killings in December of 1968. And then according to the operator, the man then gave a very eerie, goodbye, and hung up the phone. It's creepy. God, I hate that. <laughs> but yeah, you see seven months in between murders. Like That is quite a long time for a serial killer. I mean, not when they're in their like heyday, I guess. If yeah. You say. Like when they're like first starting to chop their hits. Because the, the first few, there usually is a bigger gap and then they get shorter and shorter as they right. go. And that's eventually why they get caught is because they go into like that crazy mode where they kind of just start killing indiscriminately really quickly. And then it's just, it's too hard for them to hide all the evidence for them to get away. Right, right. They get too brash. But in this case, it's just also interesting that. Again, with that increased confidence, literally calls, like calls in and explains the entire situation. Yeah. And the, like the person who did it, like they op- the uh, dispatch woman, she's been interviewed multiple times and she talks about this phone call and she says, I will never forget that voice that I heard on the other end, mm-hmm. especially the goodbye. And she says, there's no way for me to describe it to you and there's no way for me to replicate it for you that would do it justice. So <laughs> I can't imagine getting that ingrained into my mind. That being the one thing that I always remember. Can you imagine being a 911 operator just oh. in general? Ooh, yeah. Nope, I'm good. Later in August of 1969, local newspapers began to receive letters. One of them, sent to the Vallejo Times Herald, was written by someone claiming to have been responsible for the two shootings. The letter included details about the victims, the weapons used at each shooting, as well as the brand of ammunition use. The letter includes multiple spelling errors, such as Christmas being spelled with two S's at the end, but it does have information that only the killer and the police would have known. For the December shooting, the the writer listed 1. Brand brand name of ammo, Super X. 2. 10 shots fired. 3. Boy was on back, feet to car. Four, girl was lying on right side, feet to west. For the 4th of July shooting, they listed, one, girl was wearing patterned pants, two, boy was also shot in knee, and three, brand name of ammo was Western. The letter concludes with, quote, here is a cipher or that is part of one. The other two parts have been mailed to the San Francisco Examiner and the San Francisco Chronicle. I want you to print the cipher on your front page by Fry Afternoon, Aug 1st, 69. If you do not do this, I will go on a kill rampage Fry night that will last the whole weekend. I will cruise around and pick, all, pick off all stray people or couples that are alone, then move on to kill some more until I have killed over a dozen people. End quote. Also can't imagine being the first person to open up that letter. Yeah. <laughs> There's, I typed this out verbatim so that I could see the spelling errors. And it's, that's how hard it is to yeah. read because he spells stuff. Like he spells cruise, C-R-U-S-E. And he spells until with two L's. Like he spells fry night, like F-R-Y. Right, yeah. <laughs> it's very weird. And also just coming up with an entire decipher, or excuse me, like a cipher code. Yeah. Like this, this is the work of someone who wants the attention, wants like the story of it, to just explode 
and again, America's Jack the Ripper. Yeah, it's it's interesting too with this case because you get you have like product and process killers, where mm-hmm. product killers just want the bodies after they kill the people, and then you get the people that crave the adrenaline of actually doing the the crime. And he's kind of in the middle, mm-hmm. like he because he shoots them quickly and then leaves. So he doesn't want the bodies, but he also doesn't take his time with killing them. I think it's just kind of interesting that he doesn't really fit either one specifically. I think he just gets so attached to the fame of it, yeah. like, which we'll see coming up. But for example, with the first murder, like it was seven months, no communication. People weren't even aware of this man existing, right? They were just looking for a shooter. Yep. And then number two, or murder number two occurs and then he starts taking credit for it right so like he's starting to get more and more addicted to the fame and publicity side of things which again we see with the btk killer who eventually gets caught yeah because he <laughs> he's wants, a fucking idiot <laughs> he missed the fame of it and for people that don't know the btk killer was bound torture kill uh killer um we, that's another episode i guess we could yeah. do one day but yeah i do think the zodiac killer is Zodiac killer is very addicted to the fame side and of it. That's why I think you could call him a process killer, because mm-hmm, like the part of the process is sending the letters and sending a little note, putting of, a pen to paper. Yeah, the games that you play with it. So that original letter then ends with a circle containing a crosshair, which would become the Zodiac's calling card. The two letters postmarked on the same day to the San Francisco Chronicle and San Francisco Examiner were virtually identical to the first one, claiming the three parts of the cipher contained the identity of the killer. After receiving these letters, the police asked the writer for more details to prove that they actually were the killer. And in response, the killer wrote the following letter, which I will, re- I will read the entire thing verbatim. And I'm not going to say what, there's a ton of spelling mistakes in this. I was thinking about pointing them out as I went, but that would, it would take forever. Yeah, we'd be here a minute. If you do want to find these, they're all online. They're very easy to find. So here you go. Dear editor, this is the Zodiac speaking. In answer to your asking for more details about the good times I have had in Vallejo, I shall be very happy to supply even more material. By the way, are the police having a good time with the code? If not, tell them to cheer up. When they do crack it, they will have me. On the 4th of July, I did not open the car door. The window was rolled down already. The boy was originally sitting in the front seat when I began firing. When I fired the first shot at his head, he leaped backwards at the same time, thus spoiling my aim. He ended up on the back seat, then the floor and back, thrashing out very violently with his legs. That's how I shot him in the knee. I did not leave the scene of the killing with squealing tires and racing engine as described in the Vallejo paper. I drove away quite slowly so as not to draw attention to my car. The man who told the police that my car was brown was a negro about 40 to 45 rather shabbily dressed. I was at this phone booth having some fun with the Vallejo cops when he was walking by. When I hung up the phone the damn thing began to ring and that drew his attention to me and my car. Last Christmas. In that episode, the police were wondering as to how I could shoot and hit my victims in the dark. They did not openly state this, but implied this by saying it was a well-lit night and I could see the silhouettes on the horizon. Bullshit. That area is surrounded by high hills and trees. What I did was tape a small pencil flashlight to the barrel of my gun. If you notice, in the center of the beam of light, if you aim it at a wall or ceiling, you will see a black dark spot in the center of the circle of light approximately three to six inches across. When taped to a gun barrel, the bullet will strike exactly in the center of the black dot in the light. All I had to do was spray them as if it was a water hose. There was no need to use the gun sights. I was not happy to see that I did not get front page coverage. That's the fame part of it. I mean, he's, it's almost comparable to a movie director giving behind the scenes like notes to their movie yeah like he's really relaying step by step his process and also did he just invite did he just invent uh lasers on guns (laughs) yeah seriously like did the u.s military read that and be like write that down we could do this too (laughs) like smith and weston was like what was that last part sir (laughs) yeah but it's very well, of course, eerie, but he even, like, 
he even points out who he thinks identified him or identified his car being like someone walking by. Yeah. And also shows the sixties by saying, yeah, exactly. That. The terminology, <laughs> the yeah. terminology. It's, it's interesting how money details here. It's either that this guy craves these killings so much that he just has the memory of it so vividly ingrained in his mind, which I mean, you're killing people. That's going to be something you're going to remember. Mm-hmm. Or he's like taking notes on these killings, like either after the fact or right as he does them, you know, so right. he's keeping tabs on what everything is going, what everything is. Do you think he has just a picture perfect memory, like a photographic memory almost? I don't know. I, I guess he could. I mean, it would track with how much he knows about everything that goes on mm-hmm. throughout as well as his correspondences with the police. It's just very interesting, too, that he has the, pres- the presence of mind to keep it cool when he's leaving in his car. Yeah. Right? To not squeal his tires and like get out of Dodge. Yep. So it's very interesting that this is his second killing, and he already is just in the right almost mindset for it. Yeah. Just keep her cool. Well, and that's that was one of the, the hard parts about the investigation for this, because Mike Madgow, the, the guy that survived this shooting he originally said yeah he drove away squealing his tires and racing off and then after the fact in this documentary he talks about how no he drove away slowly it was casual and stuff Mm -hmm. and so the people changed their recountings of what happened so much in the story so it's hard for the police to get a solid narrative right especially at the beginning yeah totally i mean when you get shot i'm sure your mind is uh, racing a little bit yeah you don't have the time to write down any details. Well, and he was shot in the face, too. So it's like, right. and you don't know what kind of psychological damage that can do to just, it could break you as a person. And then mm-hmm. your memory is just well, all also, scrambled. The gunshot happened right in his ear as yeah. well, right? So your hearing's gone. Yeah. Guns are loud. So this letter also ended with the crosshairs in a circle and ended with the words, no address but it also gave the killer a name, Zodiac, for the first time. Nearly two months later, a couple of college students were relaxing by the shore of uh, Lake Berryessa, which is near San Francisco, on a small peninsula near some oak trees. The man, whose name was Brian Hartnell, had dated the girl, Cecilia Shepard, a few years before, and the two were still very good friends. While they sat talking, Cecilia noticed a man nearby. She told Brian, but he figured it was just someone at the other picnic spot across the small inlet of water to their left. But when Cecilia said the man had a gun, Brian paid more attention and saw a man moving quickly towards them from behind a tree, holding a gun. The man was wearing a black hood with a white symbol stitched on the hood, on the chest, and it was the same crosshairs and circle that the Zodiac had used in his letters. However, Brian didn't recognize the symbol. The man held the two at gunpoint and told Cecilia to tie up Brian with plastic clothesline that was already pre-cut. She tied him up loosely, and when she finished, the man in the hood came over and tightened the knots to make sure that he couldn't get out. Brian the whole time was attempting to talk to the man, who claimed to have just escaped from prison, and as long as the two cooperated with him, nobody was going to get hurt. The man, after finishing up with Brian, moved on to Cecilia and tied her up. Then the man asked Brian to lay flat so he could tie his feet, and after proceeding to hogtie both of them, suddenly the man pulled out a knife and began to stab into Brian's back, doing so a total of six times. He then moved on to Cecilia and stabbed her ten times as she screamed and tried to roll away. Brian then realized he needed to play dead so that the man didn't come back and finish him off, and pretty quickly after, the man just walked away. Brian and Cecilia laid there bleeding for a while, waiting for someone to come help them. Brian's body eventually stabilized enough to talk to Cecilia and loosen one of her bonds with his teeth, but her hands were still numb and she was too weak to untie him. Several boats went by and Brian yelled for help, but nobody stopped. Finally, one did, but shortly after floated away as well. Brian then realized that he needed to get away and suddenly Cecilia was able to get enough strength to untie Brian, and that was when he stood up, and immediately he almost passed out from the loss of blood. But he moved five feet at a time, stopping each time, until he reached the road. 
and the first person that he met when he got to the road was a park ranger, who was alerted by the boat that had stopped for a moment near Brian and Cecilia. The two were taken to a hospital where Brian recovered, but Cecilia eventually passed away. Yeah, this one is extremely, well, they're all sad, of course, but to be hogtied and stabbed that many times, it's, that's just, I can't imagine. Well, and it's, it's the middle of the day. This yeah, is, this is the one. Yeah, that, this yeah. is like six o'clock in the afternoon. Granted, mm-hmm. it's in September, so it is probably dusk, but still, it's daylight outside. Mm-hmm. And you're getting up close and personal now. You're tying these people up, you're making it a prolonged experience, and you're using a knife, yeah. which is completely different than the first two things that you did. Right, a completely different process. Do you think that this was another instance of the Zodiac Killer just knowing like there may be a couple here, or do you think that in this case, or I guess in any of the cases, that he was stalking? These I, couples in particular. I think this one was more of a happenstance thing. I think it was just in the area. And because, as we'll see, before he, before Brian sees him, this guy is just kind of watching them. And then when he goes behind the tree is when he puts the hood on and comes back around. Right. So I think he was just kind of there and saw them. And then when he got close enough to scout it out, he realized, here's a chance. Man, I wonder how long he was on that beach for. Yeah. Just... I mean, I, I assume there were other people there like throughout the day yeah. until this lonely couple just happened to lay down to take in some ocean view. Well, not ocean views, but just to take in some views. Yeah. And just hang out, have a chill day, you know. But you also, again, just I'm trying to make the point here, like the prolonged or excuse me, the increased brashness or almost leading into that fame. Like he had, like, keep this in mind. He had like an embroidered hood. Yeah. Like this wasn't just like something I in my opinion, I don't believe something just whipped together. Like he oh, took well, no. time to do he, this, to create this. Yeah, he had a stitched hood. Yeah. He had pre cut clothesline to right, make sure that right. he could Not tie them up. That's like, a different, yeah. But like he had all of this he was very meticulous in this planning mm-hmm. out. And I mean, he as we'll see, gets very bold as he goes on. And I mean this is this is probably his most brave action yeah not brave in the way that it's like good heroic for you. <laughs> yeah but like he could have this could have been his downfall if he wasn't careful so yeah people notice men in hoods yeah i would say <laughs> but then nobody comes to help them like yeah. multiple boats pass by so it's, it's it's very interesting to see that the uh the good samaritan syndrome i guess kicked in they're like ah someone else will help him yeah right right do you think just with the fact that both of them survived for quite a long time comparatively to the other murders, I wonder why change? Like you have the gun in hand. Do you think it's just a just a power maybe like a finding yourself type of killing? I think it's just a power thing. Power At trip. this point, he knows yeah. that he's not, he hasn't gotten caught. First of all, yeah, and he's he told on himself twice. Yeah, he's given them ciphers that su- supposedly will give his identity away. Nobody's done anything with them. Right. Everyone's already freaking out. He's got Southern, or he's got Northern California in his grip. Mm-hmm. Might as well take it one step further, I guess. Right. That's true. So after the event, the police took about an hour to get there. And one of the first on the scene who found Cecilia said he talked with her for a little while as they waited for the ambulance to arrive. He said that Cecilia gave him a description of the mask the killer wore, his height, and how much he weighed. She said he was about six feet tall, weighed about 200 to 220 pounds. But however, she also said that she saw his face before he put on the hood because she was the first one to see him before he went behind the tree. She said he was white and had brown hair that hung over his forehead, but he was wearing dark glasses so she couldn't see his eyes. However, the officer who received this report from Cecilia told this, told the interviewer that he never reported what she told him claiming that he didn't think it was important at the time now that's in all the police investigations like that is the most wild thing to say there's multiple people like in the next incident as well where yeah. the officers like why didn't you tell people about this incident or whatever it's mm-hmm. like yeah i thought i put it in my report oops i guess like, not 
but you got from her the the one of the only people who has seen this man's face in right. broad daylight. Yeah, and you just thought, ah, right. Like she got a great look at him, and this is probably a again like if we have cell phones or like some sort of recording technology, maybe this helps out a ton. Yeah, it, that this the Zodiac is such a product of the time period. It's insane how, how even ten years after this. You would have gotten caught, probably. Right. So, it's very interesting that people like this kind of just pop into a time period where they can get away with something like this. Mm. It was around this time that the police received a call from a man who claimed he wanted to report a double murder. He described Brian's car, a white Carmen Ghia, and confessed that he was the one who had committed the crime. The police eventually traced the call to a payphone about 30 miles south in Napa, and the police also found that the killer had written on the door of Brian's car. The Zodiac symbol was at the top, with the word Vallejo below it, and then the dates of the original two attacks. Underneath those was the date of Brian and Cecilia's attack, written Sept 276930, and finally below it, it said, by knife. So now he's letting people know, hey, it's still me, and this time I changed it up. Right, he, he, I guess he, in a way, was like, you know what, I've been going with the fastball, going to throw a change up a little bit. This is what makes me think that he did take notes, because I feel like this is how he would record it for himself. Yeah, record for himself. Also, he knew that, I mean, we're talking about it right now. Like, again, playing into like that famous thing. Yeah. So, A, newspapers reported on it, and I'm sure he had the, you know, foresight to be like some kids on a podcast will be talking about this one day right right so like he's trying to get famous with these like that's the whole mo with all of this i think yeah and but he thinks that he killed both of them so he doesn't know that brian has survived at this point so So now he's got two people while one of them who is a little less reliable just because of how traumatic the experience was Mm -hmm. but then you've got brian who is like by a all for some reason he is just so with it this whole time for yeah. someone who just went through something like this he is very coherent he is very reticent of every or he not yeah. reticent he's very good at recalling everything that happened it's it, hearing him talk in the documentary I, he's a very brave guy to come out and relive stuff like this probably multiple times too right like he's probably been interviewed for every single book that's been written oh yeah every single movie that's been produced yeah. so he's probably told this story so many times it's also interesting because he, the Zodiac killer, literally had them tied up, right? Like he could have stabbed anywhere. So he's clearly not an anatomy expert. Yeah. Because he didn't really hit, in Brian's case, hit many, you know, the vital spots. Well, and just right? for Brian to have the wherewithal to realize if I keep moving around, like, because he keeps looking at Cecilia as he's going after her, and he mm-hmm. set, realizes if I keep moving my head, he's going to realize I'm not dead. And so he just, stops moving and stops breathing for someone in that scenario to be that cognizant of everything going on and be that able to make a decision like that yeah it's it's insane that he was as prepared for the scenario i guess as he was oh my gosh yeah i that's definitely a situation where you have no idea what you would do survival instincts just kind of kick in yeah but it's very sad in cecilia's case because she gets she sees him get stabbed yeah. In his case, it just happens, so he doesn't move at all. Mm-hmm. But for her, she's trying to roll away and stuff, so he's coming after her, and it's even more of a violent scenario. And I think that's the reason why she just didn't make it. It's just because right. she's moving around and thrashing, and he's probably just hitting anywhere and everywhere, you know. So, man, it's uh, yeah, very sad. So obviously after this incident, the cops were now floundering to find an answer to who could have possibly done this and the other two attacks. The killer was obviously getting more bold, coming out during the day, getting more personal with his attacks, and he was implementing a costume into his attacks. While they were trying to process the few clues that they got from the Lake Berryessa attack, like the fact that the killer was wearing military boots, another attack took place in San Francisco. Paul Stein, a 28-year-old cab driver in the city, picked up a fare heading for the upper-class neighborhood of Presidio Heights. While stopped at an intersection on Washington and Cherry Streets, the passenger shot Paul in the head and removed a piece of Paul's shirt. 
The man then walked away before police arrived, but the police radio broadcast mistakenly stated that the suspect was black and passing officers who had seen a man matching the correct descriptions of the Zodiac Killer passed by him because he was white. Fingerprints were found on the driver's side of the cab and may have belonged to the Zodiac, and witnesses were also able to provide enough information for a sketch to finally be drawn of the killer. It was considered a routine robbery until the San Francisco Chronicle got a letter from the Zodiac which started with the words, I am the murderer of the taxi driver, and included a blood-stained piece of Paul Stein's shirt. It's very interesting in this case. Like, the first few murders were all couples, right? Like, he targeted couples. So, kind of diving into a little bit of the psychology part of it, that leads to maybe he has some like intimacy issues yeah right you typically see that with killers where they like lash out or in many in many cases where they're i mean hunkering or excuse me like pushing down their like homosexual desires and proceed to you know act out against that but then he switches it up yeah and goes for a lone cab driver has no idea it's not in a secluded spot where i guess two of the three previous ones were and i just think it's it's just very odd that's not a couple i think this one is almost him testing the boundaries of how much he can actually get away with because now he knows he can get away with a stabbing in daylight it's like what if i just shoot a guy in the middle of the street like what was that yeah this is a heat check right yeah like when you're hot from three and you're like maybe i pull up another one yeah because i don't think this one's nearly as planned i think he's kind of this might even just be like kind of a spur of the moment where it's like Here's an opportunity. I might as well try it out and right. see what happens. If I get caught, I get caught. I already gave him my cipher with my name in it. So Right. He's really like, well, why not? Yeah. He's so. here. In the letter that the police received, the Zodiac mocked the police for not catching him, claiming they could have had him if they had patrolled the area more calmly instead of racing around in their motorcycles. He also claimed that he left no fingerprints and that the sketch of him was wrong because he had worn a disguise. The letter ends with a threat to shoot out the front tire of a school bus so he could, quote, pick off the kitties as they come bouncing out, end quote. After this letter, the Zodiac began to write multiple more letters, including more of Paul Stein's shirt and more ciphers, possibly referencing more victims that could be attributed to him. He also said the police stopped him once, but let him go. Around five months later, another woman claimed to have an interaction with the Zodiac, in which a man signaled her to pull her car over and said her wheel was loose. But when he claimed he was going to fix it, he loosened the lug nuts so that the wheel fell off when she tried to drive away. So she got into his car to ride with him, but quickly realized he meant no good and found another driver who could take her to the police. Like, like, that's the creepy, like, that's the creepy stories that you always hear of the person that survived like Ted Bundy or something like that. It's literally a Ted Bundy scenario. Yeah. Yeah, that is so creepy. Because, you know, Ted Bundy wore a cast, said, hey, can you help me with my books? Right. This guy's like, hey, your tire's loose, let me give you a ride. Right, another one of his was, like, can you help me with my boat, was one of them. Yeah. And, well, person that helped died. Yeah. So, But it's, it's interesting now that he's so much, he's taunting them. Yeah. It's not that he's just giving them information and playing games. Now he's actively threatening and this is where i think he realizes that he has san francisco truly in the palm of his hand Mm -hmm. and he can just say whatever he wants to make them scared it's like he's talking to the police in these letters like they're almost his friends right like you're giving like your pal like oh you messed up like you give your pal like some crap for it yeah right just saying you guys literally had me you stopped me you could have had me if you patrolled better. Yeah. Like stuff like that. He's almost referring to them almost, I, in my opinion, I would say just like friendly. Like he, of course, makes demands all the time and he's in it for the attention. But the way he's addressing the people reading these is very, very creepy. Yeah. And he tells in the same letter, he says, I was hiding in the bushes nearby. And if you guys yeah. would have just like taken a second to calm down and pa- actively patrol in that area where the crime happened, I would have had to come out eventually and you would have got me. Right. He's literally saying, be better. Yeah. Like, 
For the next year, letters continued to flood in to different news agencies, reporters, and one lawyer. Not all of them are verified to be genuine to the Zodiac Killer, but as they continued, the writer would claim more and more victims each time. The Zodiac claimed he was responsible for the unsolved murder of a college girl in 1966. He also claimed that he wanted people in San Francisco to wear buttons with the Zodiac symbol on them, or else he was threatening to plant bombs around the city. By mid-1974, the supposed Zodiac letters claimed the score was, quote, Me, 37. SFPD, 0. Ooh, he's running up the score quite a bit, but yeah. the bombs one is very... Very interesting. He's throwing in a little Ted Kaczynski in Domestic there. terrorism. Well, Domestic, Ted little... Kaczynski comes up as a suspect for this crime. Right. So that just shows how many people have been suggested as being the Zodiac. Yeah, the everyone wear buttons, in my honor, is definitely the most bold claim, I would say. Yeah. Like, he wants to just... It's almost like it is a God complex, I would say. There is a, a similar case. I think it was in New Orleans where there was a guy that was breaking into people's houses and attacking them with an axe. Yeah. And he wrote a letter to the paper saying everyone plays jazz music in the city on this certain night. And everyone who's not playing jazz music, I'll go in an attack. And it's this reminds me of that where it's like wear a button or else. Yeah. You know? It's just similar or it's crazy how similar a lot of these cases become the jazz one is very it's very, weird but that was it's like, almost like the it, just because lent was very very recent the story of the passover yeah exactly right like everyone paint their doorways with the blood of a lamb one year old and i won't kill you <laughs> but then they give themselves that i'm a biblical figure quality yeah you know yeah they just keep making themselves bigger and bigger as they go so in the same time period, a caller claiming to be the Zodiac was also heard on live television during the Jim Dunbar show, asking to talk to a famous attorney named Melvin Belly, but it was later found that this caller was most likely a hoax. But in addition to having killed more people, the letters also included references to musicals and movies such as The Exorcist. Unfortunately, none of these communiques led the detectives any closer to figuring out who the true Zodiac killer was and to this day, it still remains a mystery. But don't worry, because the internet has no lack of suspects for people to parse through, and with the ciphers still being cracked as recently as 2021, mm -hmm. new people are constantly being suggested. But for us today, we're going to narrow down our lens to just talk about a few of them. <laughs> Why is it always The Exorcist? <laughs> like, I, that's the yeah. like with Dahmer, like the, in the recent documentary, they show, like, we're just going to watch a movie, and of course it's The Exorcist. But it's, it's the most... Ah, it's the most frustrating way to refer to it because you're just like, ah, I saw The Exorcist. It was the most f hilarious satirical co horror comedy I've ever seen. Shut up, dude. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, you're not cool for yeah. thinking that it's funny. You're not trendy. Yeah. So to start on our journey of suspects, we're going to go through the one that most of you are probably yelling about right now, which <laughs> is the one that a group known as the Case Breakers claimed to have been the most likely suspect. In October 2021, these, this group of cold case experts, including former detectives and military intelligence personnel, claimed that they figured out who the Zodiac Killer was, and his name was Gary Francis Post. Gary Francis Post was a man who lived in California in the town of Groveland, which was about 150 miles east of San Francisco. He was a U.S. Air Force veteran and died in August of 2018, and according to local reports, Post had a violent past, with the San Francisco Chronicle being contacted in 2017 by a relative of Post who claimed that Gary tried to kill him with a hammer, and then Post's daughter-in-law claimed, daughter claimed she had to move away from California for her own safety. And in 2016, Post pushed his 20 not 24-year-old wife, his 74-year-old wife into a wall and broke her pelvis in four places, leading him to spend time in a mental facility since he wasn't mentally competent enough to stand trial. But according to the FBI, they aren't convinced, and the Kane rema case remains open and unsolved. Right, with all of these, the FBI and police have not like given much credence to any of these. Uh, but... 
first off, what an insane name or great name to have. Like, oh no, we're the crime breakers. The crime breakers. <laughs> we break crime. The case breakers, yeah. The case or thank you. Yeah, the case breakers. What do you do? <laughs> yeah, what do you do as a hobby? But Yeah, the the FBI kinda has to stay neutral most of the time. It's like even if it is the guy, he's dead already. The investigation's gonna be like a long period of time to go through everything. So it's not like they're going to immediately say, yeah, you're right. <laughs> right. Like, thank you, private citizens who don't have information that the police have. Right? Yeah. They haven't released, released everything. But the fact that they apparently broke it so many years later, you have to give like some props to. But what I wanted to talk about just real quick is like the fact that the Zodiac Killer, like, the last letter came in in 1974. Yep. Right. And then that's it. Yeah, like, no more communications. Stops. So, like, he just he just stops. Like, a serial killer stopped. Well, maybe. Maybe he just, like, stopped writing in. But this is actually something that we've seen before with serial killers. The Golden State Killer did that. Exactly. Like, he found, like, a family. Yep. Right? Like, he found something to, let's say, alleviate the need to commit these crimes or just look at your trophy case and be like, yeah, yeah, I did that shit. But he just stopped. Like, and he was like, we mentioned had San Francisco and Northern pretty much all of the Western United States, like in a stranglehold and he stopped. Yeah. So you have to, one of my conspiracies when it comes to who the serial killer was, who the Zodiac killer was, I personally think he almost had to have like found an intimate relationship, found an intimate connection because, and I'm going to kind of like stick to this with him focusing the first few murders on couples, I think psychological, psychologically he was aiming to do that because of intimacy issues that he had in his own personal life and like looking to act out against that. Like we talk about the process, right? So I think the reason why he stopped was probably because he found love. Yeah, it could be. I, it's very rare that we see cases like this where they just stop. Yeah. But, I mean, there's precedence for it. I mean, Jack the Ripper kind of just fell off the face of the earth, too. Right. And in the case of, like, uh, f- f- the family annihilators that are becoming kind of a prevalent thing lately, which is not good, uh, but there's instances where those guys, instead of being caught right away they just go and live a normal life somewhere else and then yeah. after that they're fine it's, it's very weird like when the human brain just learns to turn that off yeah how do you flip that switch especially for a serial killer who is apparently i think the reason that he could have stopped even is just because he got enough gratification in watching them struggle sure. all of these years I mean, he did what he needed to do to get them to chase him, chase their own tail. Mm-hmm. And he, it, people don't know if he's going to come back randomly. Yeah. So he's always got that hold over them. It's, it, it's almost like he doesn't have to put himself at any more risk than he already has. He could have very well just gotten bored. Yeah. Also, like, they, he's probably just thinking, like, I made that cipher, I made those ciphers so obvious. <laughs> yeah, it's, maybe I am too smart. <laughs> yeah, right. But So, back yeah. to the case breakers. They claim that their case is based off of forensic evidence and photos that they recovered from Post's own darkroom. I don't know if they recovered them, but someone did. Using the Zodiac's codes, they moved forward with the, th- with the theory that Gary Post was the Zodiac. His name apparently changed the meaning of some of the ciphers when put in, and he bears a scar on his forehead that bears a resemblance to the police sketch of the Zodiac Killer. In addition, the team said they uncovered a, quote, gold mine of evidence in California, including information that stated Post had given away weaponry, such as pistol parts, gunpowder, and shell casings, to friends and relatives leading up to his death. This evidence has supposedly been sent to forensic labs, but nothing else has been made public about it since. And lastly, the case breakers also claimed that Post had, at one time, led a group of young men that he trained to become killing machines. And these men, in their late teens and early 20s, were known as the Posse and allegedly killed animals for pleasure. Ooh. <laughs> that part, Ooh. <laughs> that's where it falls off the tracks for me. Right? Right. Yeah. <laughs> I, oh my God. <laughs> I, could buy, I could buy it up to that. 
<laughs> right. The posse. Like yeah. That's, it's, I don't think that's, you, you didn't need to throw that part in there. Do they have big hats? Like I'm very, very confused. The only thing I can think that's relevant for is if he's training these guys and they're the ones going out and attacking people for him. And so that right. leads less, there's less chance of him getting caught personally. The if, world's worst sensei. <laughs> yeah. He's Shredder, but for bad. <laughs> oh my God, but for the worst. Yeah. But despite all of this evidence, the police and the internet sleuths aren't buying the case breaker's case. News, out- news outlets ran the story with leading headlines insinuating that the Zodiac had been officially unmasked when in reality he wasn't. One former sheriff stated that he believed that the detectives working on the Zodiac case would have looked seriously into post and done their due diligence if they truly believed that he was connected to the case. Because, I mean, people involved in this case want it to be solved. It's not like they're yeah. actively shunning all of these theories. It's just most of them don't hold their weight. Right. Like, for the police to just see this and be like, oh, yeah, that sounds about right. Like, you can't do that. Then you ruin that entire family's life. Well, and up to in the past year, even, they were getting three to four new tips on the Zodiac Killer a week. From, that's how yeah. much people are still sending stuff to them to say, hey, I think it's this person. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's it really is probably one of the most infamous serial killers. Yeah. San Francisco PD investigators did apparently visit Post before he died, but it's not certain what the contents of that meeting were, and he was never arrested or charged with any of the Zodiac crimes. And the biggest kicker is that the case breakers based most of their findings off of the Sherry Joe Bates murder from 1966, one that was largely attributed to the Zodiac in online circles, but has been ruled out by the police. And the Zodiac, one of the supposed Zodiac letters claims that he was responsible for this, but a letter was sent to the police in this murder case for Sherry Joe Bates, similar to the ones the Zodiacs had sent out. But according to the Riverside Police, they received another letter in 2016 that was similar to the 1967 letter and the handwriting matched. So they tracked the person down and this person said that they sent the original letter after the Sherry Joe Bates murder as a sick joke. And thus, that almost certainly ruled out the Zodiac as being the killer. Right, the Zodiac wouldn't joke about this. Yeah, like, well, this is his... that was the only reason he was tied to it, is because of yeah. the, this note, which mm. it wasn't him that wrote it. So, unless he just killed them and didn't send anything, I mean, that could still be the case, but... Right, and this kind of gives credence to what we've talked about before, how there's clicks in the online sleuth community where, I mean, they got it wrong, and the, like the news even ran with it, but yeah. I mean, they still most likely got it wrong well this is like the headline of uh carol baskin's husband being alive oh yeah she just right. she says it and then everyone says he's alive he's alive In this yeah. case they said we got him and they said yeah yeah that's so, right but as of now it's not really a solid case but according to the case breakers themselves the full story hasn't come out yet and in due time they will be writing a book that will tell the entire tale oh so i think it's a money grab like I would, just say it if you really got it but i would say so as well i mean like what better marketing would there be or like publicity to bring up to be like this is the book that finally has the answers right, right? so next on the list is the only person that the police as far as i know had actually named as a suspect in the zodiac case which is the i think like the most interesting part about all these different suspects the majority of them are just the internet sleuths yeah. or just people doing their own research like the police only named this person yeah this is the only one his name was arthur lay allen he was a veteran and former school teacher who was fired after he was found to be molesting children oof 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 allen supposedly mutilated animals as a child according to his sister-in-law and was dishonorably discharged from the navy for undisclosed reasons during his short tenure as a teacher he was also disciplined for carrying a gun on school grounds his only sick day as a teacher was the day that Sherry Jo Bates was killed. And according to Michael Magyow, one of the survivors of the Zodiac, Arthur Lay Allen was the man he picked, up out of a lo- picked out of a lineup as the killer. Allen wore shoes that were a similar size to the Zodiac prints, and he owned a watch that had the Zodiac symbol on it. Brian Hartnell, the other survivor of the Zodiac, said Allen's voice and stature matched the man who assaulted him. 
One of Alan's friends said he was the Zodiac, telling police that Alan had talked about killing couples at random, having a desire to be called Zodiac, and he attached his flashlight to his gun like the Zodiac claimed to. Alan said his favorite book was The Most Dangerous Game, which includes hunting down humans, and on the day of the Lake Berryessa attack, Alan said he was going to go there, but changed his mind. Alan's home contained sketches of bombs that supposedly matched those referenced in the Zodiac letters. So it sounds like a pretty convincing case. Right, yeah, you hear all those facts. The one that sticks out to me, of course, is the, the wearing a watch with the Zodiac insignia if you will on it yeah and then like, you, that pops up quite a bit <laughs> and a friend that's just like he told me he was a zodiac killer right right and it could also just be the friend just mad at him or whatever but yeah or just trying to be a part of the story right right you see that but a lot you also get you can also see like his background a little bit where it seems almost too stereotypical right like he mutilated animals when he was growing up he was like he had behavioral issues like it almost seems like too easy yeah and also like if he was an educator most likely went to school like why all the spelling mistakes also like in the letters see that's the thing with the spelling mistakes for me or is is that just like part of i feel like that's a diversion right because with one of the other suspects that I i didn't list here but they compare his handwriting to the letters and it is a pretty close match, but his normal writing's always in cursive, whereas the Zodiac letters are always just in straight lettering. So mm-hmm. that, to me, if, if that guy is like a valid suspect in this case, that would, to me, be a good way to throw everyone off. Not only are you spelling things wrong, but you're also using a different type of penmanship than you use in your everyday life. So it's going to be way harder to track that back to you. Mm-hmm. So I... There's things, little things like that, which is why it's so hard to pick a suspect that actually sounds good. Right. Do we know what, do we know, was he a high school teacher? No, I think it was younger. I, I see. Okay. I didn't see specifically, but right. I think it was. So. Well, I mean, either way, if he is a teacher, he probably is aware of like Lover's Lane or oh, yeah. where like the hookup spots would be. I guess that would make more sense if he was a high school teacher, but. Right, right, right. And also a gun. Like, we just kind of glanced over he carried a gun on school grounds. Yeah. I, he is a wild man. Yeah. It just, it just says that he, oh, various elementary schools. Hmm. So, yeah, kids. 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 <laughs> Not uh, good. He molested kids, kids. Kids, kids, kids. But naturally, there are issues here, too. First off, the evidence is all circumstantial against him. DNA and fingerprint samples did not match that of the Zodiac that the police have on file. Additionally, Alan's handwriting didn't match the Zodiac letters. Police went and checked his trailer and found that he owned a windbreaker that was allegedly worn by the killer, but once again, that's circumstantial evidence. Alan also didn't bear that much resemblance to the police sketches, which are believed to be pretty accurate. He was likely too old as well, being 44 around the time of the first attacks, so not late 20s or early 30s, as the witnesses had guessed. He never committed any violent crimes, only sexually deviant ones, and he was also predominantly left-handed, whereas the attacks were all carried out by someone using their right hand. And despite the fact that he was somewhat ambidextrous because they tried to force him to be right-handed as a kid, which is a thing that was pretty common back in the day, surprisingly. Was there just, was there just discrimination against lefties? Yeah. They, they would literally, in school, try and force people to write with their right hand if they were left-handed. For a long time. That's a, it that's a wild thing. scrambles but... the brain. That, there's another serial killer. I don't remember who it was, but they tried to do that to him, too, and just kind of messed him up. Because... Different yeah. sides of your brain control different sides of your body, so trying to force the other way. That is so whack. It's and that's weird. probably that's probably the time that's probably the time in history where you could still like hit kids. Oh yeah. For, like, They're getting whacked by the meter sticks right. or yard sticks. But even though he was somewhat ambidextrous, neither the left or right handed writing samples matched the zodiac letters. So nothing could and at the end nothing could physically tie Arthur Lay Allen to the crimes. So when he died in 1992 of a heart attack, he took any secrets he had related to the case with him to the grave. So another bust on that one. Another one bites the dust. So this is the one that I think is personally one of the more compelling ones that I read about. 
In 2022, Jarrett Kobeck offered another new suspect, Paul Alfred Dorr, or Dorr. In his book, How to Find Zodiac, Kobeck brings light onto the new suspect by sharing some very compelling circumstantial evidence against Dorr. Once again, just circumstantial. Through reading the Zodiac's communications with the police, Kobeck realized that whoever the killer was most likely enjoyed nerd culture with his references to the musicals and obscure comics, as well as the exorcist and stuff like that. So following this train of thought, Kobeck found an old sci-fi zine, which was, if you don't know what a zine is, it's a self-published, like limited run print work magazine, usually something online. And it was called Tight Beam. Paul Dorr had written letters to the editor of Tight Beam declaring that citizens should fight back against the system by addressing letters with multiple one-cent stamps instead of one multi-cent stamp, which mirrored one of the Zodiac letters sent with six one-cent stamps. <laughs> Repel against the man stamps. Yeah. I don't know what that do, but you do you, buddy. All right. After tracking the return address of this zine letter, Kobeck found that Dorr had published zines of his own. Kobeck was able to find a few of them, some focused on Lord of the Rings and others on survivalism. One of them included cipher discussions with Dorr spelling the word C-Y-P-H-E-R instead of C-I-P-H-E-R, which is what the Zodiac did in his letters. Dorr also enjoyed medieval cosplay, which is a possible explanation for the hood during the Lake Berryessa attack. His survivalist zine had instructions for making the same bombs that the Zodiac had outlined, including the same instructional error in both outlines. But at this point, Kobeck still knew that all of this was still just coincidental and circumstantial evidence. After doing more digging, Kobeck found that the bomb formula that he had published was originally published by a militant right-wing group known as the Minutemen in the late 60s, or the mid-60s. And guess who was a member of the Minutemen? Paul Doerr. Kobeck realized that he was falling into a rabbit hole, and eventually he did write a 19-page document of his findings with a bunch of caveats in it, and he sent it to the San Francisco Police Department. He still hasn't heard back, but Kobeck kept going, and he found yearbook photos that resembled police sketches of the Zodiac, as well as book references that Doerr used, which also appeared in Zodiac letters. Eventually, he got in touch with Dorr's daughter, and he found more support for his theory with her. According to her, Paul Dorr read a lot, attended Renaissance fairs regularly, and swapped firearms with Hell's Angels members. He almost always had a notebook, compass, penknife, and two loaded pistols with him. Dorr tutored his daughter in cryptography, giving her weekly puzzles that she had to solve to find her allowance. But he also had a violent side most likely stemming from service in World War II and Korea, is what the theory is. Paul Doerr himself told grandiose stories about breaking Japanese codes, meeting the president who thanked Paul for helping the Allies win, and being a part of special forces. And when he met the president, the president apparently kissed him. Oh! <laughs> so, ooh. <laughs> You're telling me Lyndon B. Johnson just gave him a little smooch? There's some presidential fanfic in this one. Ooh. Also part of his writing, wow. (laughs) (laughs) But according to military records and co-workers, these were likely made-up stories because they do not show that he served overseas. (laughs) I guess this does lead to the, or support the point a little bit that I've been trying to make with that search for grandeur. Like, he's writing fan fiction, he's writing, like, sci-fi stories. He's also making up that the president gave him a little peck. Yeah, but there's, there's a lot of serial killers that when they they'll serve in the military but they'll never see actual combat right and that's another thread here that we kind of see because uh leonard lake and charles ing they were a, a pair and leonard lake served in the military but he never saw combat he was just kind of a, a radio guy mm. and he would tell stories about going into combat and stuff too so it's it's these weird parallels that all of these guys kind of have in common it's really weird Serial killers are just weird. <laughs> but also, it's very... He does love a good puzzle in his day. Yeah, he's doing cryptograms with his daughter. I mean, that's very specific. The Yeah, it's very... <laughs> like, he spells cipher the same way. All yeah. All that good stuff. 
So Pulp likely made up the stories about his time in the military, but what he did do was attack his family. One time he threw his first grade daughter up a staircase, and another time he tossed her overboard on a boat and dragged her through the water with a rope. Psycho. Yeah. And around the time the Zodiac murders began, Paul almost killed his daughter after finding out she had been using drugs and had been out with a boy, picking her up off of the ground and punching her. This assault took place right around the time of the December 20th killing. So we have a very violent man, knows his way around a firearm well enough to shoot these kids in the dark, like has a very much of like familiarity with firearms and how to use them. And he's mad at his teenage daughter very for mad. going to a lover's lane with someone else. It's starting to pile up. Yeah. It's, like the psychology of it. It's, it's a very interesting case. And it's uh, his daughter, Gloria, said that when he had her off the ground and was hitting her, he was saying, this is how you hit people to not leave bruises. So he obviously knew a thing or two about how to be violent correctly. Right. Yeah. What a psychopath. Paul left a collection of firearms to his daughter when he died, but since she was a convicted criminal, she had to give them to someone else who was a hoarder, and the woman said that they were lost or someone probably stole them. And this is where the track gets a bit cold and skeptics start coming out. One book critic named Laura Miller wasn't convinced, stating that Kobeck used old photographs to confirm his theory, sometimes photoshopping a beard and glasses onto the photos or off of the police sketch to claim that they matched. No. <laughs> <laughs> so Photoshop kind of <laughs> yeah. a little bit. Many seem to believe Kobeck is suffering from a serious case of confirmation bias, which is seeing every new discovery as fitting his agenda. So he's, a lot of people say he's just another kook looking to make his name famous from a famous cold case. But Paul Dewar's daughter, after meeting Kobeck, admitted that she thinks he's correct. And all that they say it would take is for Dewar's fingerprints from the time in his service, from his time in the service, to be compared to the Zodiac and see if it matches. But as of now, it's just another theory that is lost in the clutter of tips that the police get every day. And at the end of the day, it's just more circumstantial evidence until something changes. Yeah. I th the fingerprints is interesting, but again, we're talking about extremely, extremely circumstantial evidence for a dead man. And right? the, thing, the thing with the fingerprints, too, is they think that it's probably the Zodiac, as far as I could tell. I don't know if yeah. those fingerprints are actually his. Yeah, I mean, the Zodiac even says those fingerprints aren't mine, but you have to take that as it is. Yeah, right? so it's, 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 that's why this case is so complicated. I know. It's like, is it his fingerprints or not? And we don't know. Well, and then half the stamps that he sent, he, you just use like a water mixture, yeah. a water solution to get them like to stick and stuff. So he didn't actually lick any of them. Right. Or there's maybe one that he did lick. So it's, uh, it's such a complicated case. But there are also people with Paul Doerr that say, he since he loved to do survivalist stuff like he loved hunting with a bow and arrow and a knife they said that he wouldn't be the kind of guy that would probably use a gun mm. he would probably try and use something more complicated to test himself or challenge himself weird it's, there's never been a serial killer with a bow and arrow yeah yeah right. oh, well. the green arrow but bad but bad <laughs> so the last suspect that i want to cover today is a man named lawrence kane According to the sister of Darlene Farron, who was the one that was shot at Blue Rock Springs Park, a man resembling Lawrence Kane had bothered Darlene at her restaurant, and the police officer who claimed to catch a glimpse of the Zodiac after the Paul Stein murder agreed that Kane bore an eerie resemblance to the killer. The woman who was confronted by the Zodiac on the roadside also picked Lawrence Kane out of a photo lineup as the man she was almost abducted by. In addition, a French engineer claimed to have solved the two shortest and most unsolvable ciphers from the Zodiac Killer. According to him, the one that was supposed to give the Zodiac's name was decoded to be the letters K-A-Y-R, which was similar to one of Kane's aliases of K, spelled K-A-Y-E. And they also say that that would be consistent with the spelling errors that the Zodium fell victim to constantly, especially in a complicated cipher. So the the R instead of the E isn't too surprising. Kane had worked in the Navy, where he may have learned about coded messages, and he suffered from brain damage after a 1962 car accident, leading Kane to be unable to, quote, control self-gratification. 
He also had family that lived near the house, or he also had family that lived near the site of the Paul Stein murder, and there was a birthday party going on that day at that house. Mm. After the attack with the brown car, Kane traded his similar car in for a different one within days of the attack. And later in life, Lawrence was also investigated for a murder that happened in Las Vegas. Honestly, this is the one that I think is the most, you know, it's really connecting the dots. Like it's a car, through like a few days later after the incident happens, I think it's just, it's, it's a little too close. There's so much, like all of these have so much circumstantial stuff where right. it's so hard to not like give a little head, head tilt and say, ah! uh, uh, maybe, maybe. But this one is obviously messy, too, because the Frenchman who, quote-unquote, cracked the ciphers was immediately thrown under the bus online, Mm -hmm. and the ciphers have been declared unbreakable by most experts due to their length, being that they're only 13 and 32 letters long, because for code breaking, you base everything on patterns. So with such short ciphers, it's hard to establish any kind of pattern to figure out which letters are here, which letters aren't here. Do you think part of that was... Like we've talked about those internet clicks. Yeah. And like everyone's like, we didn't solve it. They can't be right. Yeah. But also he claimed to have solved it in like two weeks. Oh. And these people have been working on it for 30, like, four, what is it? 50 years. Yeah. So. <laughs> but like, is he, I believe it, he used like software programs, correct? No, he just... Oh, he just... see. Okay, so, okay now, now it makes sense. So the one cipher... It's not Sudoku. <laughs> the cipher that was solved in 2021, he used the same key that they used to solve mm. that one, and he applied it to this one. And, sure. And apparently said, hey, it worked. I think they would have tried that. They would have tried it, <laughs> so yeah. So that's why I don't really give this one much credit, but I mean, I give him respect for trying. I mean, the, the people that cracked the first cipher was just a teacher couple that lived at home like an elderly teacher couple so anyone can solve them it just depends on who wants to dedicate themselves to it yeah that's true but back with like lawrence kane it's interesting that he was i guess bothering darlene at the restaurant as well a few days beforehand but i right it was it's it's, she said a man resembling him so it's Mm. was it even him you know right it's hard and also, I, I just think, like, the woman who escaped him, too, like, yeah. a car ride, where, like, you're interacting with this person for quite a long time. That is that is the one that I think gives the most credence to him being the person, right. is the fact that she picked him out of a lineup. Because with, with all due respect, Michael Magow, him picking someone out of a lineup, I don't trust as much, right. just given the fact of how much he's changed the story over the years Mm -hmm. based on his recollection, which is nothing against him. I mean, it's just, he had a very traumatic thing happen. So obviously things are going to change as you try and process what happened. So in addition to the Frenchman, probably not cracking those ciphers, there is no extra information about what the lineup looked like for the photo identifications. So it's not really known what the comparable suspects looked like. So Mm. they could have just looked wildly different than the sketches. And then they picked the one that looked the most like it. And once again, it's all circumstantial yes. evidence. Yes, <laughs> it is all circumstantial. <laughs> basically, nothing definitively ties him to the crimes, aside from the word of basically one investigator who was the one that led this, the case against him, and a French guy who had extra time during COVID. <laughs> right. <laughs> and there isn't a good analysis of his handwriting to compare it to the Zodiac letters, and Kane had a pretty heavy New York accent and yeah. had curly hair. So, based on what Brian said said about the guy in the mask, probably wasn't him. I guess then conclude, like, there's, everything is just going to be circumstantial, like, going forward. You know, this happened 50 years ago. Right. Or it ended 50 years ago. Started 55 years ago, but... I mean, there's no way that we can really right. identify someone well, unless... Well, half of the people they think it was are already dead. Right. So you can't interview, interview them anymore. So, I mean, the person could still be alive, could still be listening. If you're listening, give us our big break. Come on the show. 
Just don't. I mean, just I was about to say, can we have some caveats? Just here? don't kill us. <laughs> <laughs> Please. Well, they have to be eighty by now. I hope. Yeah, hopefully that's we true. Can, <laughs> if we can, hopefully we can take. <laughs> we have two dogs. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> So like I said, there are literally dozens of suspects that people put forward to be the Zodiac. But at the end of the day, if the investigating officers haven't said anything that has proven to be tied to the Zodiac, it's all just conjecture or hearsay. One man who I mentioned earlier in the episode named Timothy Voigt has dedicated nearly three decades to compiling his website on the Zodiac Killer. And he believes it was someone I didn't even mention because nobody even knows if that guy was in the U.S. during the murders and the police kind of ruled him out. But who the hell knows? Nonetheless, the Zodiac has been and will remain one of the most infamous unsolved crimes in the world, next to the likenesses of Jack the Ripper and D.B. Cooper. It is, I, I think I say this all the time, but the Zodiac Killer is one of those truly most infamous stories of history where everyone knows like the name, but not a lot of people know the story of yeah. it, like what actually happened, who got murdered, how many people got murdered, and what that actually is. Like means like a very appalling person in yeah. the history archives. It's, it's it's so frustrating. I know, <laughs> like the answer has to be somewhere. I honestly, I honestly think that the ciphers are just meant to throw people off. Like spend time on that, you fools. Like there's no yeah. way I'll put my name in there. Well, and there's so many spelling errors within the ciphers themselves. Yeah. So it's it's hard to even know. If this guy knew what he was doing, obviously right. he knew what he was doing because they make sense. Mm -hmm. But did he really know what he was doing enough to make it coherent? Right. He. This could just be a classic case of serial killer just keeps on getting lucky and lucky. Yeah. Like maybe he truly did mean to write a cipher that has all the information on it. Yeah. But maybe he just did it wrong and he just has been getting lucky. I, but like some of the people that we didn't talk about, there was one guy who was. Uh, arrested on a statutory rape charge and mm -hmm. the, he like was the judge the one of the judges that or the attorney that was against him or something was someone that was related to one of the victims it's like huh what yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so there's so many different people you could look into if you want to do this at home on your own and i i needed to get my brain back yeah i couldn't i couldn't keep diving down different rabbit holes <laughs> the brain dump of the gems of history podcast yes so that's uh that's kind of the zodiac killer i guess yes honestly a great very interesting topic to cover but you guys can let us know who you think it was i mean of course do your own research but of course listen to this podcast and let us know who you think it was and you tell can do your that. friends to listen to this podcast tell your friends yeah rate review subscribe uh, but you can interact with us on our Patreon, which we recently launched. It's at Gems of History Podcast. Uh, we are currently offering one level of subscription of Patreonage. I don't know. Yeah, it's patreon.com slash Gems of History Podcast. But yeah, you can support us there. Uh, we have some cool stuff on there. Uh, you can also follow us on Twitter at Gems underscore History. You can follow us on Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube, and Facebook at Gems of History Podcast. The Facebook is more of a discussion group, which would be a great place to give us your hints, theories, yeah. any sleuthing that you've been doing into the Zodiac Killer. Just let us know. Yeah, I've uh, I've been posting all the full episodes on YouTube, so you can go in there and comment. And one guy commented on one of our shorts and made me seriously think about our branding for the first time. Because it was about the Tokyo firebombing, and he commented and just said, this is a gem? I was like, hmm, how do I respond to this? Yeah, right. <laughs> I guess it's a blood diamond, huh? It is a blood diamond, <laughs> yes. It's a fire emblem, if you will. Yeah, but I, I do realize I've missed a uh, couple weeks recently for the shorts. It's just been it's a busy time. So Honestly, in both of our lives, yeah. we, we do not have a lot of free time. Yeah, so sorry about that, but I'm, I'm going to try and get back to a regular routine with it. So, uh, thank you guys for listening. I don't know if I got anything else for you. <laughs> Stay polished. <laughs> I haven't said it this Stole time. Stole it for me. Yeah, 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 let's go.